Come on, brother, and bless us. Would you open a Bible this morning to the 16th chapter of Matthew? Be looking at a lot of verses this morning as we talk about discipleship in context. When the Lord Jesus called his disciples, many of them were just fishermen from the Galilee. And... Uh, you know in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus walking along the shore, calling Andrew and Peter and James and John. Have you ever wondered why he would call fishermen to be disciples? There's a great his historicity behind all of that, by the way. I'll tell you just a little bit of it. They lived about 80 miles north of Jerusalem. Galilee's about 80 miles north of Jerusalem. And Jesus was calling people that he could teach, that he could train. You see people that in Jerusalem, they were more tainted with religiosity. And you can't teach anybody anything if they think they got it all figured out. These fishermen were rough, hardworking men, and they were not always what they should have been. But Jesus saw something in them that could be great for his kingdom. He knew Peter was going to deny him. He knew John had a hot temper. But he knew they was going to be great one day. He's looking at you this morning. And he looks beyond all of those faults in your life. And he sees what you can become for his kingdom. Now listen to me. God even takes your failures and turns it into something good. And that's what he did to those fishermen. I wish I had time just to give you a sermon this morning on fishing in Jesus' time. And and why he called the fishermen. But we're talking about discipleship. Those men would leave their home of Galilee. I, if I had any place to live in the world, if I had my choice, it would be the Sea of Galilee. I've never been to a place like that. And uh, maybe someday I can move there. But uh, you feel this sense of belonging, this sense of coming home. And those guys left their home to go into the Roman world to preach the gospel of the risen Christ forever changed the course of humanity. And they were not educated men. They were simple men. But they were filled with the mighty power of God. Now that's what I want you to get in your spirit this morning. This is what's missing in most of our churches. It's what's missing in most of Christendom today. People are trying to get qualified to serve the Lord. You can't get qualified to serve the Lord. He's the one who makes you a disciple. You can go to school all you want to, but it's not going to make you a disciple. You've got to walk with the Son of God if you're going to be a disciple. Today in our Western world, we think evangelism is discipleship. That's not true. That's why we got a lot of people walk through the door of salvation, and they have never have gone any farther. They're still where they were. They've never grown up in the Lord. You know the number one problem I found in traveling over these years? There's very, very few disciples of Jesus. There's a lot of people who tell you they're Christian. Very few disciples. And we're going to find out this morning why. We think building a local church is discipleship. It's not. Uh, I don't want to be critical of anyone, but what we call church in America is a far, far cry from what Jesus was talking about. And, uh, you know, the idea of being in a building and all of this came from the Catholic Church. Uh, church is you. You're the church. Church is in the hearts of the people. But we think in America, if you build a big building, you know that that's discipleship. That's not true. We think if you join a church, no, no, no. That came along back in the 1800s of joining a church, you know. Hey, when you become a member of the body of Christ, you're a part of his church. But we, we make a big deal about joining the church because we've got budgets to meet. and We want people to be a member where they'll pay their tithes and meet our big budgets, you know. It's so sad, really. Uh, prior to 328 A.D., by the way, everybody that met in church it was in the house. Check your New Testament. Paul addresses to the churches that was in their house. Like Lydia in Acts 16, 
It started, we've been to Philippi, and they started a church there in Lydia's house. Uh, the Hebrew word for church is kahal. Now, the Greek word is ekklesia, but the Hebrew word is kahal. It means the called out people. Has nothing to do with the building. Before 328 AD, there was nothing like, there's no, no such thing as seminaries or clergy. We Gentiles have turned it all into big business today. And please, I'm not being critical. I love all the Lord's people. But ministry today is big business, big business. Uh, you look like a preacher and learn the church talk and get you a good education and get a good salary, you know. It's sad, really sad. I had a church uh, less than a year ago, a large church, they want me to be their pastor. And they asked me how much money. And they said, we've got all the money you need. Money is no problem. A big Christian school. I said, we'll pay you whatever it takes. I said, you had not got enough money in this town because that's not what the Lord's called me to do. And, uh, but today, it's big business. That's the reason a lot of people quit going to church. They saw the big business. You got some of these white preachers, some of these black preachers. If you took the money, money away, they wouldn't even be in the ministry today. So sad. Ministry was not a profession before 20, 328 A.D. It was a calling. And we've lost that in our culture today. Stay with me. You want to be a disciple? Look in Matthew 16, verse 16. I wish we had time to get into all these uh, pericopes of these stories, but we just hit what we can this morning because I don't think you'd be with me two or three hours, so I'll do the best I can in a short period of time. Look what happened in Caesarea Philippi. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Matthew 16, 16. Peter said those words after Jesus asked them, Who do men say that I am? Some said he was John the Baptist. Some said he was Jeremiah or Elijah or one of the prophets. And Peter, the Heavenly Father, revealed to Shimon Peter, that fisherman, Thou art the Messiah. Christ comes from the Greek word Christos. In the original, it's Mashiach, Messiah. He's the one the prophets wrote about. He's the one Moses wrote about. He's the one Isaiah wrote about. He is the Messiah of Israel. But he's more than that. He's the son of the living God. Wow. Now watch me. The Bible teaches there's one God, but he operated in three persons. Look at the pronouns in the book of Genesis. We, us. Uh, scholars have never been able to understand it. No one can understand the triune Godhead. But there's only one God, but he just operated in three persons. Jesus is the eternal son of God. And when Jesus walked this earth, he was God in the form of a man. Do you believe that this morning? You must believe that if you're going to be a disciple. You've got to have a strong faith in Jesus as the Messiah of Israel, and he's the son of the living God. Notice the word living God. It goes from the back to the book of Jeremiah. The God of Israel was the living God in contrast to the dead pagan gods. So when Jesus walked this earth, he was the son of the living God. I wish I had time to get into all the context of that, okay? If you're going to be a good disciple of Jesus, you must be a person of great love. Look in Matthew, Matthew chapter 22. Look at what Jesus said. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. The second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor is thyself. If you're going to be a good disciple, you've got to love the Lord with every fiber of your being and love your neighbor as yourself. You know, the Lord's really hit me pretty hard with that over the last few years. <clears throat> you can't preach it, Carol, if you're not going to live it. I'm not impressed with your ministry. I'm not impressed with your singing or your preaching. How much do you love other people? You know why? Because God lives in people. You can't love your neighbor. I mean, you can't hate your neighbor that you're looking at. And say you love the Lord that you can't see. Look at the people around you. God lives in people. And do you want the best for your neighbor? Do you want as much for your neighbor as you want for yourself? There's so much uh, 
competition in the churches today. I thought when I went into ministry, all the preachers was going to love me and help me. It's just right the opposite. A lot of jealousy in ministry today. They want all the glory for themselves. But if you're walking with Jesus, you're not going to be jealous of the brethren. You're going to be hoping your brethren's going to be doing good. I want to see the Lord's people be blessed. I want to see you do good. I want you to reach your potential in the Lord's kingdom. Are you with me? You're going to be a disciple of Jesus. You're, you're building disciples for Jesus and people to follow Jesus. You're not building disciples to follow you, but disciples to follow Jesus. And we have to love people. Don't uh, try to see what that person can become through the grace of God. They could be a diamond in the rough. Try to see people that way, okay? Now, if you get this this morning, you'll leave here different than when you came because this has really changed my life over the years. Loving God and loving people. Loving God and loving people. If you're going to be a good disciple, you have to learn the importance of humility. In Matthew chapter 18, in verse number 4, look what Jesus said. He was in his hometown of Capernaum when he said these words. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And he said that after the disciples were murmuring and arguing who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom. And Jesus gave them a lesson. You want to be great in my kingdom, you have to humble yourself as a little child. There's no room in the Lord's service for pride or haughtiness or thinking that we're better or more spiritual than somebody else. You want to be a disciple, you must walk humble before the Lord. I've got to tell you this little story quickly. Uh, Donna gets on to me sometimes with telling stories, but my father was this real childlike fellow. Couldn't read and write, I think I mentioned to you last night. My dad was a simple man. I loved him dearly. He's gone on to be with Jesus. They live not too far from where we live out in the country up north of Mississippi. And one day I went out my father's house and he was sitting on the carport crying. I said, Dad, what are you crying for? He said, well, son, I saw you on television a while ago. I said, you did? He said, yeah. He said, I'm afraid you're going to get too big for Jesus. And it was just like God talking to me. And he said, son, he said, <clears throat> Jesus that died on the cross, you've got to walk humble to walk with him. I went back out my house, and that was one of the greatest sermons anyone ever gave me. And dad told me, he said, son, when you have to put a gate up out at your house, you don't got too big. And every time I get a little bit too big for my britches, I always think about that. Seriously. You want to be a disciple of Jesus, don't ever think you're better than anybody else. There's no big shots in God's kingdom. Okay? We must walk as little children. Hey, it doesn't matter if you're 95 years old. If you're born again, you're a child of God. And you always remember that. He gives certain people different uh, callings and different abilities to propagate the gospel but we're still children of the Lord. All the glory goes to him. Hey, he hung the stars in the sky, created everything, and he didn't ask me or you how to do it. He don't have to have us to do anything. And if you don't follow the Lord, he'll, he'll get somebody else. So don't ever think you're something, okay? Because he don't have to have you. And when you travel as many miles as we have, we've seen the Lord do a lot of powerful things. And he does it in the people that you're not looking at, in those small things. That's where he's at. All right, if you're going to be a good disciple, you need to learn the scriptures. Luke 24, 45, the resurrected Jesus, look what he did to the disciples when he was resurrected. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. <clears throat> it's, it's one thing to read your Bible. It's another thing to understand the Bible. You want to be a good disciple, you've got to know the scriptures. 
one of the biggest problems in American Christianity is biblical illiteracy. If you knew how many people here this morning really knew the Bible, it would scare you. It would scare you. Some people go to church all their life and can't quote you three verses of Scripture. That's our problem. See, people think it's that we leave that up to the preacher. You know why you're shallow in your faith? You know why you're up and down with your emotions? You're not grounded in the Scriptures. If you study God's Word, the Holy Spirit that wrote the Bible through godly men will fill you and empower you where the things of the world won't bother you so much. You'll be an even kill. You won't be up and down all the time. But you've got to get in the Word, okay? And I'm not talking about just reading the Word. I'm talking about know how to study. The Bible says rightly divide the Word of truth. You know why we've got all these different denominations in America? The Baptists, the Methodists, the Presbyterians, the Pentecostals, the Assemblies of God, the Church of Christ, and all, <laughs> and all of them are Christians, and they can't worship together. It's because they pick and choose their verses in the Bible, and they're started by a man. I want to tell you something. You want to be a disciple, you follow the truth, and the truth is Jesus himself. And there's things in the Bible that will upset every church's doctrine. Did you know that? There's, there's verses in the Bible they all stay away from. You want to be a disciple? Learn the word of God. And it take, You know, sometimes I have uh, people call me and ask me Bible questions from different parts of the world. <clears throat> and sometimes I don't know the answer. You know, I try to help them every way I can. The smartest people I know in the Bible are Jewish people who have been saved. I mean, a Messianic Jew who really knows the word, he'll eat your lunch. He'll eat, he'll eat your lunch. Uh, but I don't agree with them on everything. But anyway, uh, sometimes people ask me questions, and, and, uh, and they'll say, how did you ever learn that in the Bible? How'd you? I'd say, well, first of all, I know very little. I know very little. But it takes years and years of walking with the Lord. And you've got to prove that you're going to be faithful in the little things before the Lord's going to give you the big things. The Lord, can he trust you with wisdom? Can he trust you with the word of God? If you're one of those haphazard Christians and you're just here today and gone tomorrow, the Lord's not going to give you the deep things of the kingdom. You can forget it. Most Christians are so carnal today, they're more in love with the things of the world than they are Jesus. But if you get serious about it, the Lord will get serious with you. Okay? You want to be a disciple? Learn the Word of God. I want to tell you something about the Bible before I leave this point. None of us here have ever, ever read the true Word of God. We read translations of the Word of God. Jesus spoke Hebrew. Some of those words are not translatable into Greek or the Latin or the, or the English. The true word of God, there's no errors in the word of God. Now, there may be errors in translations. If your translation contradicts itself, don't let that bother you. That's just the translation. The true word of God has no error. Are you with me this morning? And the word of God is Jesus himself. He is the word incarnate. So you follow Jesus. Don't let a translation upset your apple cart, okay? You want to be a good disciple of Jesus, you need to be well seasoned. Look here in Mark chapter 9, verse 50. Salt is good, but if the salt have lost its saltness, wherewith will you season it? Have salt in yourselves and have peace one with another. The Gospel of Mark. Kind of a strange verse there. You know what the context is? John had rebuked people for casting out demons that wasn't following them. They wasn't following their group, and he rebuked him. Jesus said, John, don't do that. If they're not against us, they're for us. In other words, they don't have to be in my camp to be followers of Jesus. And he goes on to close that little uh, pericope in the Gospel of Mark 9, saying, you need to be well-seasoned. Don't be in competition with the other brothers and sisters. 
If you lose your seasoning, you're no good in the kingdom. And there's a lot of Christians lost their seasoning. Do you think you have to be a part of your group to serve the Lord? Hey, let me tell you. I was asked years ago, I was called in the country of Ireland. They wanted me to come preach in the country of Ireland. I went over there and I found people over there. They didn't worship nothing like we do over here. And some of our music they find very offensive. But you know what? There's some people over there that really loved our Lord. And they wouldn't feel comfortable in your camp. And you wouldn't feel comfortable in their camp. But they love the Lord. You've got to be big enough to realize that God's got people all over this world. And some of them love him more than you do. And none of us are right on everything that we interpret. Nobody has all the truth but Jesus. And realize that structures and styles of worship, it's all personal preference. And be a well-grounded individual. Realize that that person over there, you may not agree with them on everything, but if they believe Jesus is the Son of God, you can join hands with them. Okay? There's a lot of things that I don't agree with. But if they love Jesus, then I can sit down at the table with them. Are you with me? Be a well-seasoned individual. God's kingdom is a vast thing, and he's got room for everybody. Sometimes we Christians are like the judge, you know. Yeah, we're the first ones to knock down our own soldiers. Isn't that something? We're the first ones to condemn a man or a woman of God because they stumbled along the way. Hey, let me tell you something. If it wasn't for the grace of God, you'd be in the ditch this morning. If God hadn't watched over you, you wouldn't even be here this morning. Who watches over you at 3 in the morning when the devils of hell are after you? And you don't even know it. You have no right to judge anyone. Judge not lest you be judged. There's a time for righteous discipline. There's a time for righteous judgment. We can judge the fruit of a tree. But we have, look, if I had a walk where that boy's walked, I might have done worse. If you'd have been where that woman's been, you'd, been, you'd probably been in worse shape. So be careful. It's easy to brag about your piety and your religiosity when you've lived a sheltered life and when you hadn't been tempted like other people. Are you with me this morning? Hey, there's some people out there, they never had rocks thrown at them like some people. You take a beautiful girl, look how the devil's going to throw rocks at her. But we're the, the church is the first one to condemn her. Be careful. And that gifted young man, that gifted young man, look how he's going to be tempted in his life. And if he makes a mistake, the church is the first one to kick him. You want to be a follower of Jesus? Be a well-seasoned individual. It doesn't mean you're compromising, but we don't judge the Lord's people. The Lord is the judge. And I want to tell you something. When all the dust is settled, when all this thing is over, the Lord, he'll take care of all that. He knows how to judge righteously. So you keep it. And sometimes we judge people when we don't even know the facts. You know, don't even know the truth. All right, if you want to be a good disciple, let's get into the sermon this morning. You got to have courage. In Matthew chapter 10, in verse number 32, look what our Lord said. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. And it's not talking about walking the aisle in a church necessarily. It's talking about confessing Christ in your daily life. I want to ask you a question. Do you ever talk about Jesus with your wife? Do you ever talk about Jesus with your husband? Is Jesus ever mentioned in your home? You, you're professing that you're a Christian here this morning. 
Do you not ever mention his name in your home? Do you ever mention his name to your children? To your grandchildren? Taking up the cross is not easy. It takes courage. But the closer you walk with Christ and the more you study his word, the more he will empower you to speak his name. When I first became a follower of Jesus, I was working a little furniture factory in those days. And I was so naive. I thought everybody that went to church loved the Lord. I didn't know nobody, no different. And I started taking the Bible to my factory every day. Well, guess what? Church people stayed away from me. They thought I was on some kind of religious kick, and I was out of my mind. They really thought I was crazy. And it didn't take me long to realize that most people go to church just to look good, you know. And even my pastor in those days called me into the street one day in our little town and said, Carol, I need to have a talk with you. I said, all right. He said, I think you need to slow down just a little bit. You're growing a little too quick. You need to just chill out just a little bit. And that really discouraged me because I thought everybody that went to church loved the Lord. And I thought that everybody just talked about Jesus in their daily life that was a Christian. It's just not that way, is it? And I'm not saying you've got to wear it on your sleeve all the time. I'm not saying you go around preaching to people all the time. But at the same time, don't be embarrassed to speak the name of Jesus, okay? If God makes the way for you at Walmart next week to witness to somebody, you witness to them. Don't you back up, okay? And make Jesus a part of your daily conversations. Your children, they need to see Jesus in you. You can bring your kids to church all you want to. That's not going to get it. They got to see Jesus in you. Okay? When Jesus called those disciples from the shore of Galilee, my, my, they never dreamed that they'd have the courage to go into the Roman Empire, Asia Minor, Northern Africa, and give their life for preaching the gospel. But Jesus gave them the power, and He'll give it to you too. Be courageous with your faith, okay? Don't be. Uh, self-righteous about it but be courageous with your faith and don't back down okay don't let people scare you they're just people I've, I've been run off from houses I've been cursed out you name it I've had it happen to me I've had demons after me I've had everything after me but greater is he that's in you than he that is in the world you are more than a conqueror through him that loved you so don't back down, okay? Here's the Roman Empire roughly in the time of the first century. Can you imagine those fishermen? Now watch this. Fishermen from Galilee and then take the message into the entire Roman world and they didn't have no education, but they had the power of Christ and they forever changed the course of the world. That's what the power of God can do. Okay? has nothing to do with religion, has nothing to do with organized religion. It's you and Christ. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. They had to deal with Caesar. They thought Caesar was God in those days. That was one of his names, was that he was the God, son of God. They had to deal with all the paganism and all the gods and goddesses of the Roman Empire. Have you ever studied about the gods and goddesses of mythology? You need to do a little study on that because they're partially true because they were borrowing of some of their thoughts from uh, the uh, fallen angels over in Genesis chapter 6. It gets kind of deep, but uh, they were some of their ideas was coming from the Bible. It was just distorted. Uh, but Poseidon wasn't the god of the sea. Jesus is the God of the sea. Are you with me? And when they went into the Roman world, Poseidon is not the one that calmed the water. I was on the Sea of Galilee, and I saw Jesus calm the water. Are you with me? So think of the courage it took. Jupiter, Zeus, they're not the king. Jesus is the king. This, it took courage to do that. The fishermen from Galilee... 
They're the ones that change the course of mankind. For us, there wouldn't even be a church here today if it wasn't for them changing the world. If you're going to be a good disciple, you need to love not the world. What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world, lose his own soul? Mark 8, 36. If you want to be a good disciple of Jesus, uh, don't be so uh, attached to the things of this world. I'll tell you a little story. If you've never heard it before, you're going to leave it all behind. <laughs> you ever heard the story of the two country men in the country store years ago? One said, you know, I heard Brother Josh passed away. The other man said, yeah, I wonder how much he left. Old fellow spit in the fire, and he said, he left it all. I just uh, just preached a message this past week. I preached a funeral of a dear friend of mine. He was very, very wealthy. He left it all behind. Left it all behind. Hey, nothing wrong with prosperity. It's not, it's not a sin to be rich, but it's a sin to die rich. You need to do something with it. If God brings prosperity to you, you see how you can bless the Lord's people. And you'll find you cannot outgive the Lord because he'll bless you in ways other than money can't buy. I'm telling you the truth. You know, when I started in evangelism, I had 20 cents and a $100 car and no place to go. I know what the Lord can do. I know what he can do. Nothing wrong with enjoying life. The Bible says he created all things richly for us to enjoy. Not anything wrong with enjoying life. The Lord wants you to. But just put him first, okay? Put him first. And I'll tell you what, if you put Jesus first, don't be surprised if he don't bless you. Okay? But you don't follow the Lord for the blessings. You follow him because you love him. If I have to live off bread and water, I'm still going to preach the gospel. Are you with me this morning? Thank God. I don't have much money. Don, I'll tell you that. But that's okay. That's okay. I don't need a lot of money. Hey, you know what you do if you live in a mansion or if you live in a shack? All you can do is take a bath. Lay down and sleep. You know. You may, you may sleep a little faster than I do. But life is life. And no matter how much money you got, your britches goes on the same way. You know. And don't be shook up with people. Because a lot of people, I got a friend of mine right now is having a problem. Because he don't understand why God lets wicked people prosper and righteous people suffer. Read Psalm 73 when you get time. Psalm 73. It's a fallen world. There's a curse on the earth. Sometimes life's not fair. If you're one of those kind of people, you're not going to be a good disciple. You've got to get bigger than all that. Never turn back. You're going to be a good disciple. Jesus said unto him, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Luke 9, 62. Don't ever look back to your successes. Don't ever look back to your failures. Always look ahead. You know, the Lord will give you revelations later on that you can't receive now. Your, your little old mind can't take it all at one time. But as you grow in the Lord, he'll give you deeper and deeper and deeper things. Okay? If you never look back, don't trust it. You know, so many people say, well, I made my decision when I was nine years old at that little Baptist church. Well, you did? Well, hallelujah. Well, what have you done since then? Is that what you're trusting in? Bible don't say pray and be saved. Bible says believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. A lot of people trust in a prayer and joining the church and getting water baptized to be saved. No, no. Don't look back. Where are you today? I was preaching a revival one time, and the pastor's wife came forward in the revival, and the whole church just couldn't believe it. And she said, well, I've joined every church my husband has pastored. And she said, I've been baptized so many times, it's embarrassing. But she says, tonight I realize I'm not born again. I'm just not saved. And that night, gloriously, the Holy Spirit birthed that woman into his kingdom. Don't trust in the past. Where are you today? 
And don't you worry about what anybody thinks about you. If there's not anything wrong with going to the Lord with a simple prayer, something like this. Lord, I thought years ago that I, I gave my life to you, but I'm here today and I just don't know. Be honest about it. And Lord, if I didn't give you my heart, I give it to you today. That may be poor theology, but the Lord understands. Are you with me today? Be honest with the Lord. He'll be honest with you. If you're going to walk with Jesus, there's a terminology from the first century called the dust of our feet. You know what that meant? They would, the student would walk behind the rabbi on the dusty roads of Israel, and the dust from their sandals would enshroud them. Can you imagine the dust of the sandals of Jesus enshrouding you? And then that was taken to a deeper level in the teaching that the teaching of Jesus would enshroud you. So that's how we are to be as disciples. We let the dust of the feet of Jesus cover us as we walk behind him. You must take up the cross. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Everybody has a cross to carry. It's a tough one, but we must be willing to suffer for Jesus. And what does that mean, Brother Carol? It doesn't mean that you provoke people. It doesn't mean that you go around preaching at people. But there will be people that you work with. There will be people in your family that don't want to hear about Jesus. You can expect it. Jesus said, the world hated me. They'll hate you too. Don't you expect everybody to love you because you're following Jesus. It's a fallen world. The devil's got his people out there too. And some of them are in your family. Some of them are in your family. So don't let it trip you up, okay? There is suffering if you're going to follow Jesus. But let them see Jesus in you. Don't return evil for evil. You let them see the goodness of God in you, okay? And you know each one of these things we could talk about all morning. I must move on. Matthew 16, 25. Whosoever shall save his life shall lose it. Whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Got a little nugget to share with you. That's one verse, just one of hundreds that we know Jesus spoke Hebrew. That's Hebrew in style all the way. You can't get Greek out of it. It's a paradox in Hebrew. If you save your life, you lose it. You lose your life, you find it. That's Hebraic, Jewish style of teaching. If you lose your dreams in Jesus, you'll find yourself. You give up what you want to be in life to what God wants you to be, and you'll find joy, and you'll find purpose for your life. One of the great things the Lord's done for me in my life, he gave me a purpose I know what life's about for me. I know what I need to be doing, and I'll be doing it till I can't do it no more. A lot of people flounder through life. They try this job, that job. They're trying to find themselves. Well, I'll tell you where you find yourself. You'll find yourself in the one that created you. Christ will give you purpose for yourself. He'll make you feel confident about yourself in him. You don't have to feel second class. You lose your life in Jesus and you'll find your life he is the bread of life one of the great things Jesus ever said was Ani lechem hakim. in the Hebrew tongue it means I am the bread of life I'm what life is all about you lose your dreams into me and I'll give you sustenance and purpose for your life looking for Jesus you're going to be a good disciple I know I've been a little long this morning please stay with me Watch ye therefore pray always that you be not accounted that you be accounted worthy to escape all those things that shall come to pass, and to stand before the Son of Man. Luke twenty one thirty six. If we're going to be good disciples of Jesus, did you know all the followers of Jesus in the first century? They were hoping he would come in their lifetime. They were hoping he would come in the first century. I don't know when Jesus is going to come. But I can tell you this, with the signs in Israel today, I wish I had time to get into that three-hour sermon, but with the signs in Israel today, it could be in your lifetime. It could be in your lifetime. Turkey, Russia is making their way into uh, Syria, coming into Israel. Hezbollah, Hamas is being backed by Iran. Read Ezekiel 38 and 39, the, the war of Gog and Magog is coming closer and closer to being let me tell you, Israel, there are signs in the Holy Land today that have never been in the history of Israel. There's over 9 million people in Israel this morning. 9 million people. 
And God's drawing the Jewish people back to the land in these last days, just like he said he would. Israel became a nation again in 1948, and the prophetic clock started click kicking real fast. And it could be in our lifetime. So live your life each day hoping for the Lord to come. Not just because it's in the Bible, but because you want to see Him. You want to be with the Lord. That's a disciple. I want to see my Jesus. I want to be with my Lord. No more troubles. No more problems. No more fear. I want to be with my Lord. In closing this morning, just let me share this with you. I thank you for your attention. No matter what you've done in your life, no matter where you've been, I want you to know with the grace and the mercy of Christ, he can turn you into a mighty, mighty disciple. There's a sphere of influence that you have that nobody else has. You don't know it, but there's people watching you. There's people know you, and they're watching you. You can make your life count for the Lord's kingdom. And you know, <clears throat> I think I may have mentioned last night, but when we stand at the judgment seat as, as Christian people, the only thing that's going to count is really what we've done for the Master. The rest of it's not going to matter. So make a commitment this morning to follow Jesus all the days of your life. And please don't ever turn back. And if you have a doubt in your heart this morning that you ever have Jesus in your heart, would you invite him to come in today? Would you do that? I sure do love all y'all, and I want the Lord to bless you. I want to see you filled with joy. Would you bow with me in closing? I want to ask Brother Andy, if he would, to come to the front. And I don't know how y'all do things here, but if you just be patient with the Lord this morning. Just maybe there's someone here today, and you're not sure. Would you just say a simple little prayer, something like this, from your heart to God, something like this. Heavenly Father, I believe that I am a sinner. And I believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. I believe he died and rose again. Would you come into my heart, Lord Jesus? I receive your free gift of everlasting life. Would you protect me from Satan? Would you teach me your word, O oh Lord? Would you make me one of your disciples? Lord, I receive you today and use me the rest of my life. Thank you for hearing my prayer today. If you said that prayer from your heart and you really meant it, would you let the Lord know it today by not being ashamed of him? I just want to ask you this morning just to get up out of your seat. Come tell Brother Andy, I invited Jesus in my heart this morning, and I'm not ashamed of it. As we stand, will you come? As we stand, will you come right now? I have decided to follow Jesus. Will you come? I have decided. To come to follow Jesus. Will you come? I invite Jesus in my heart this morning. Will you come? As a Christian, would you make a commitment this morning to be his disciple? I want to follow him all the days of my life. Come. I want to be a disciple.
the cross before me, no turning back, no turning back. Will you come? I want to be a disciple. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow stay till the Lord gets through. Will you come? I want to be a disciple of my Lord. I want my life to count in His kingdom. Will you come today? I'm not ashamed to let the people know. I have some problems in my life. I need the Lord to help me there. I need the Lord to help me. But I'm going to follow days of my life. Lord, would you teach me your word? Would you put a love in my heart for people? Would you come? The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before The cross before me, no turning back, no turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. Hallelujah. To follow Jesus, no turning back. Will you come? No turning back. Would you bow your hearts in prayer? Would you pray for those that are struggling to make a commitment to Christ today? Maybe you don't feel led to come publicly today, but would you make that commitment in your heart? To study the word of God. Don't be ashamed of the Lord in your daily life. He's looking for common people just like you. They can be great in the kingdom of heaven. If you make the first step, he'll make the second one for you. One more verse. Would you like to come publicly? One more verse. Will you come? Before we close, will you come? Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Lord, we worship you. Oh, we worship you, God. You are King of kings and Lord of lords. You always have been. You always will be. The great I am. We thank you for your presence these last couple of services last night and again today. Thank you for moving in our hearts and lives, God. Thank you for the music, the preaching of the word, the testifying, the ears to hear, God, among your people. Ears to hear. Lord, thank you for what you've done. We ask you to bless the food now and the hands that prepared it. Thank you for the, the outpouring of, of, of your people 
of your spirit in your people and sharing that with the Robertsons through these people, God. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for what you're about to do in our church. Thank you for allowing them to come and be with us this week. Thank you for allowing them to come and share Jesus with us this week. Thank you for allowing them to come and break bread with us this week, the bread of life. It's been good. It's been great. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Don't forget to go by the tables on your way out, right around there in the trail riders.